Good morning, my name is Dr. Craig Cometer, and I'm a professor of urology and a professor of obstetrics and gynecology here at Stanford University Medical School. Yes, for benign prostatic obstruction, aquablation has several benefits. While it is equivalent to the excellent results we obtain with transurethral resection with electrocautery, photovaporization with laser, homium, homium laser enucleation, also with laser, it is much faster. Because it's a robotically controlled arm, it uses a high pressure water jet that can do a 60 to 90 minute surgery in about four to eight minutes of resection. And results have been shown to be equivalent to those other modalities for prostates less than 100 cc's. But for the large prostates that would either be ineligible for transurethral resection or take two or more hours for resection, the aquablation technology also does this in four to eight minutes. So what gives us an advantage is the speed and the ability to tackle larger prostates endoscopically. And perhaps most importantly, it's the preservation of sexual function. There's a 0% erectile dysfunction rate and only an 8% rate of retrograde ejaculation compared to the other technologies that have a 5 to 10% risk of erectile dysfunction and a greater than 50% chance of eliminating ejaculation. So better for sexual outcomes, faster, which means less anesthesia, and the ability to tackle large glands endoscopically. So we were confident that aquablation would work for urinary retention, but urinary retention is not very well studied, so we wanted to prove it. So with urinary retention, it turns out that about 72 to 79% of men will actually urinate after a trial of removing the catheter. And it's closer to that 79% if they already know how to do self-catheterization. So the bar is already high that you have to be better than 72 to 79%. And when we reviewed the literature, we saw that prostatic urethral lift and uh, water steam therapy were no different than a simple void trial having success rates for urinary retention in the mid 70s percent. And prostatic artery embolization was actually worse than a simple void trial with less than half of the men urinating. But it's well known that transurethral resection of the prostate and photovaporization of the prostate and homium laser enucleation of the prostate have excellent success rates for retention over 90%. So we wanted to evaluate this relatively new technology. So we compared our men without retention to men with retention. And we saw two things. Number one is that the results as far as Euroflow, residual urine, satisfaction, and symptom score were equal regardless of retention. Patients invariably did well. But most importantly, if you were in retention, there was a 98% chance that you become catheter free after this surgery. So while we expected men who were obstructed in retention to urinate after surgery, this was our chance to prove it. And we found that 98% of men indeed resume normal urination, no more need for catheter after this surgery. Well, we actually had a learning curve and we had the COVID pandemic. So at times we were sending patients home the same day with a trial of urination one day later. And when there wasn't COVID, we were keeping them overnight and generally sending them home with the catheter for another one or two days. Often it depends on the day of the week. If we operated Friday, we tend to leave the catheter until Monday. But we learned as time went by and as we studied our results, that if you were not in retention, you had a very high chance of urinating, whether or not the catheter was removed day one, day two, or day three. But if you were in retention, either chronic retention, a high post void residual, self catheterization, or an actual indwelling catheter, then there was a higher rate of failing that first void trial. And since patients don't want to come back to the emergency room or to the clinic for a catheter, we started to delay their void trial and ultimately came up on one week 
as our recommended time for a void trial. So we learned if you come in without retention, we can get your catheter out day one, two, or three. We usually choose day three. And if you are in retention, we leave the catheter in for an entire week. There was a slight difference. If you were doing self-catheterization, about 64% passed that first void trial within one to three days. This was in our early days when we were taking everybody's catheter out early. And if you had uh, an indwelling catheter, it was only 57% voided. Now, while these were not statistically different, we realized that there's too high a failure rate of the void trial at day one, day two, or day three, whether or not you have an indwelling catheter or self-catheterization. But specifically, self-catheterization had a slightly higher successful void trial rate when done early. But when we delay them to a week, the vast majority void immediately. So the range varied, it went from one month to three years, the average was around eight months of retention. So it was real. These were people who failed multiple void trials. So we felt that there was a strong indication for surgery, but it turns out the duration of retention with the catheter or with self-catheterization or with just a high PVR did not affect the void trial outcome. Now realize those who had an indwelling catheter or who did self-catheterization, did have an empty bladder or at least a cycling bladder. So to the best of our knowledge, that bladder cycling or chronically empty bladder would improve outcome versus someone who has a chronically over distended bladder. But it just turns out that there was no difference. Residual volume, indwelling catheter or self-catheterization. And I think the reason why we showed no difference is 98% voided. So with nearly everybody voiding, we can't really show a difference in void trial success. And it's actually changed the way we manage our patients. Previously, I would do urodynamics on all these patients. And if they had a contractile bladder, then we would do surgery knowing there's a 100% chance of successful urination. I mean, if someone's obstructed and you unobstruct them and they have a good bladder, they will always urinate. But we used to fear doing surgery on patients with a weak bladder or even a non-contractile bladder on urodynamics. But since these patients invariably void after this surgery, we no longer do urodynamics on these patients and we take them to surgery knowing that 98% will void. And if you don't void with the surgery, you're no worse off. You can resume self-catheterization or an indwelling catheter we just haven't faced that problem except for 2% of the uh, cohort. So while aquablation certainly has advantages, especially with sexual function and the speed of the surgery, not everybody has the robotic system. And while homium laser enucleation can have excellent results, even for extremely large prostates, not everybody has that training and skill set. So I don't think there's one best procedure for everybody. I think there are different phenotypes. Small prostate, no median lobe, sexually active, especially young. That's an excellent candidate for an office-based procedure, a prostatic urethral lift or steam therapy. If the patient is more appropriate for resection, meaning he wants a higher success rate or has a larger prostate, and has a median lobe, then I think resection is a better option. And that leaves us electrocautery, TERP, uh, laser photovaporization or enucleation, or aquablation using the high pressure water jet. If the patient is not sexually active, then there's really no difference in outcome for those patients with the typical prostate size of 40 to 80 cc's. And I tell the patients, we can do any of the three, it's your choice. However, if there's a large prostate or if there is sexual activity, I try and guide them toward the aquablation rather than electrocautery or laser because of the better sexual outcomes, the slightly better outcomes in these large prostates as far as efficacy, 
but also the speed of surgery to minimize the length of anesthesia.